to the start of a new series of Green Christian Workshops that we are doing throughout 2023. And we're going to be holding a, a workshop around about the first Wednesday of every month. There might occasionally be a clip in that, but mainly the first Wednesday in the month. And the Join Enough Talks are continuing through the year on the third Wednesday in the month. So you have a choice of a talk, experts and really good talks, or a more interactive workshop, which is what we hope these will do. And I'm delighted that we've got Mark Bolton here, who is going to give our very first talk. And then there'll be some time for discussion. And we're going to have some breakout groups with some questions to quickly think and talk about, and then some general discussion. And we will end by quarter past eight at the very latest. So Mark has been a very regular contributor to, on Sealink to those of you who are on the internal Green Christian email discussion. But when he sent his description in, I learned quite a bit about you, Mark. I didn't know before. So you, Mark is a retired zoologist whose career included working as a UN consultant in Africa and Nepal, then working with Sir Peter Scott to advise WWF International on environmental education. I did know he built his own carbon negative house in the Cotswolds following passive house principles. And in 2009, he is an early bird, he raised funds for and installed one of the first solar roofs on a church. And he's currently eco church coordinator for all the Birmingham and district Methodist churches. So we've got a good chap here on the title of today's talk, which is keeping warm and saving energy. And Ruth, you're going to sort out some breakout groups while we're seeing Mark's talk. There we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Over to you, Mark. Yes, OK. Um, I suspect there's quite a few people in the group now who know at least as much <clears throat> as a zoologist knows about energy. And I hope we'll have plenty of time for them to share their ideas when we get to the end. So some of the stuff I'm going through is pretty simple and straightforward, and I'll skip over it fairly quickly. There might be one or two things uh, that you find on the way uh, that are of uh, are, are, are new to you. It's pretty basic, but rather important that the whole of the Earth's life systems actually depend on the transmission of energy. And in nature, we hardly notice it. Uh, <clears throat> but in fact, over long periods of time, nature has left us alternative sources of energy I use the, the word alternative rather carefully, different sources of energy that are the sources that we now use most of the time to power our industry and our homes. Um, keeping warm was the first part of the title, and I'm sure you remember it got quite cool just before Christmas. Um, and <clears throat> if you keep an eye on the weather forecast, it's looking as though it could be quite cool again by the middle of February. And just about the time that uh, we thought we're going to need uh, more heat than we usually have, suddenly the energy prices go up by uh, amounts that we probably could never have guessed. So let's look briefly, and these are very straightforward, so I won't spend much time on them. Uh, what did we do on December the 12th when it got down to uh, at least minus 10? Well, these are some of the obvious things. Maybe we, did, we didn't do the first uh, once we noted what we were paying for uh, new prices for electricity. <coughs> Same applies to the thermostat. Um, and maybe if we got a fire in the grate or a burner, we put that on. But at that time, we suddenly realized that <coughs> from round about 15 or 20p, our energy costs were doubling or trebling. <coughs> and it's not only the increase in the cost of energy. Um, at the background to what we're discussing tonight is the whole question of what using that energy is doing to the planet. So here's some of the things. Maybe you didn't get up quite as early as usual. Uh, you left the curtains pulled. Uh, all these are a bit obvious. Go to a warmer space. It's quite interesting that some of our churches have provided warm spaces for those who really couldn't afford or weren't able <clears throat> to find anywhere warm, or you perhaps just went out, took the dog for a walk. 
but your options <coughs> were probably a bit limited. So I'm stepping back a bit to look at the bigger energy picture. It <coughs> initially very much related to where we get it from and a bit later on <coughs> to how we might produce some of it ourselves. And in the middle of that, with increased costs, we're wondering whether we might cut down in some way or other on the amount we use and therefore on the bill that we pay. Um, traditionally, of course, as we all know, it's been <clears throat> oil and gas uh, that basically have fossil fuels that have supplied our energy, although coal has been phased out significantly more recently. And we all know, again, that that is <clears throat> the basic concern now, because that is helping us heat up the planet, whether we like it or not. We're in the middle of an energy crisis, um, and it doesn't look so it's finished with us yet, because although there's a lot of comings and goings in the news, it does look as though in April we'll be paying more and maybe we'll be getting less support. So why is this happening? Well, obviously, in part, it's due to the conflict in Ukraine, but it's also very closely and rather peculiarly tied to the wholesale prices of energy. Uh, and that is, uh, I was just looking earlier that <clears throat> the general cost to generate uh, solar and wind and so on is around about five or six p a kilowatt. But gas at the moment is selling at 30 p a kilowatt on the wholesale market. And our electric prices are tied to gas. And that really is a nonsense. And a lot of people realize it and are trying to do something about it. So a quick, a rather important question, I think, both in terms of cost to you and cost to the planet. Uh, where do you get your <coughs> energy from? Um, have you taken up courage and had a smart meter fitted? Do you know how much energy you use? And then the one at the bottom, the little guy with the um, <coughs> spectacles on, have you heard of Hugo? Hugo is a, a new software freeware program that I think, uh, as long as you've got a smart meter, will tell you just about everything you need to know and quite a bit more about your energy use, uh, what time of day and so on. Uh, best and worst rated suppliers, uh, I'm not going to name names at this stage, but they may come up in the discussion later on. Let me just say that there is an enormous amount of greenwashing still going on with the main suppliers. So some of the obvious things first as to how we cut down on our energy use. Uh, we can get on a bus in Stratford. Uh, we're quite lucky there are some hybrid electric buses already, and I think we'll see a lot more of those in the future. Some of them might not even have drivers. Oh, we can cycle or walk. Perhaps not when we get quite to um, the age that some of us have reached. The obvious, obvious wise old owl says, turn off the lights. How many houses do I go into where there are lights left on in all sorts of rooms that nobody appears to go in? Um, don't leave your kit on standby. That may be a small amount of electricity, but it all adds up. If you eat more veg, not necessarily go vegan or vegetarian, and you buy local, you're saving energy, maybe not yours, but you're saving energy in terms of the planet, and using less water too. Water has to be treated and pumped, so that too uh, saves energy. And another half a dozen, well, everyone's talking about insulation at the moment. Uh, the cheaper initial thing to do is to put up some thicker curtains on, on your main doors, um, we're also beginning to talk about triple glazing, like the Scandinavians, rather than double glaze. And the obvious thing, I guess most of you have done it, is to check your light bulbs. We should all be using LED bulbs now. And in the middle picture, you'll find the compact fluorescent on the left that was the intermediate bulb, which did save energy before LEDs came, up, came on tap. Uh, you can check your security lamp. Uh, mine goes out when I open, oh, sorry, mine goes on when I open the door. 
and my wife says it goes off too quickly when I shut it, but you can decide on the time. And that little light there uses only 10 watts on the bottom left of electricity. Turn down your heating and find out what you're using. The owl was the old meter that a lot of people got, oh, best part of 10 years ago. And most um, uh, suppliers now will let you have a meter. Uh, I need to try and keep going. So obvious, isn't it? But how many people put the kettle under the tap and turn the tap on and then put the kettle on and then find it's half full of boiling water they don't want? If you're really keen, you can buy an eco kettle. Um, you, know, <clears throat> you should think carefully about power showers and baths. You can do your washing at a lower temperature. Um, for me, tumble dryers are out. Uh, nature does it for you. Uh, and of course, you can grow your own food, which again is saving energy. One thing I found just quickly, you see that 15H on the left. That is our washing up machine, which is 16 years old. And my energy, I'll talk about it later, is very much cheaper in the early hours. And only by preparing this program did I find that I could set that machine, I had to dig around a bit, to go in 15 hours time. And so it will start up at one o'clock in the morning and it will use electricity at a third of the price. Uh, you can see on the right hand side that when it's running, it will only cost 12p a minute instead of 41p a minute if I switch it on when it's full, um, you know, after lunch. Um, using renewable energy is um, a significant factor. So it's making sure you buy energy efficient devices. Just look at the number of pluses. If you've got to get a new washing machine or anything else, just see how many pluses are by the A. Uh, you can compost your waste, uh, and that's giving you some free stuff for the garden. Um, and as I said earlier, you can use your water carefully because that costs energy, or you can put a couple of bins up like I have here to collect rainwater off the, off the roof. So we all know now we are in the middle of a global energy crisis, and <clears throat> we all know it's important we need to help uh, address climate change. So here's three things uh, you can think about and pray, maybe discuss later. Are you buying green energy, not green washed energy, real green energy? Do you know what the credentials are of the people that you bank with? And do you know anything about where your pension or savings, if you're fortunate to have some, are invested? Because those all have a very large impact. Um, on sometimes the cost and always uh, on what we're doing to the planet. So I'm moving a little bit now towards what are the options to generate some of your own? Well, there's four straightforward options here. Some of them still, um, some of them still uh, can get uh, support from government. You can put panels on that generate electricity and there's no longer any vats and they've got much cheaper. You can put panels on that generate hot water. There are grants available still. Uh, you could put a small wind turbine in, but that's not for most people. And what the government's pushing us hard to do at the moment is to install a heat pump. Um, that uses electricity, of course, but it does so very efficiently. So let's look at solar PV panels. That last picture, incidentally, uh, was taken in Germany where they are way ahead of us in terms of using their public buildings to generate solar energy. On the left is a very interesting little building in Bishop's Cleve near Cheltenham, where the whole estate has solar panels. Um, there's a typical one on a barn in the middle. On the right hand side, there was a large solar farm in Wellsbourne until recently. Uh, I had shares in it, just a few, um, and it had a strong wildlife um, uh, part to it as well. At bottom left are my first solar panels, which uh, we had no suitable roof, so they went on a rack instead of part of the hedge. The middle one is where we installed the <coughs> solar on, I think, the first Methodist church in the UK in Cheltenham. And at 
interesting one on the right is where we ran a project when uh, we were part of Stratford and Evesham to raise money to buy solar lamps for um, young kids in Kenya. But just look at the bottom line before we move on. Look at the difference between 2010 and today. A huge increase uh, in energy over the last 10 years. Thank you for going back. 0 0.01 gigabyte gigawatt to 14 gigawatt. 750 homes to 10 million. But overall, we don't still generate much from um, solar, not as much as we could. Um, just a specific here, when I moved onto the plot to build this house, um, <clears throat> I inherited a large barn. And almost as soon as we got in, I decided we'd put solar on the barn. And most people said, you're crackers. How could anyone spend 28,000 pounds on putting solar on the roof? And as you can see on the right, OK, I was an early starter. We've now generated more than £50,000 and over 110,000 kilowatts. So it was a very profitable exercise. Um, these are solar hot water panels. Uh, and for much of the time, they kept, for the whole of the summer, six months, uh, they gave us free hot water uh, nonstop. Um, they're less frequently seen, perhaps, than solar electric, uh, but they're probably significantly cheaper. Uh, if you didn't know what a heat pump looks like, uh, that's what it is. That's the Mitsubishi pump I put in about uh, two years ago. And the principle of the heat pump is that they use electricity extremely efficiently. Um, at peak, for one kilowatt you use, they give you four kilowatts of energy. Um, there are still grants available, and the most efficient thing, if you ever have the chance, as we did here, is to put the heating under the floor rather than uh, into radiators. And just touching on two or three other sources for completeness, I've got a tiny wind turbine here, which I've been testing for a company uh, close by in the bottom left-hand corner, but on the whole, uh, wind turbines for domestic use um, are probably not many people's option. But for country use, they're huge. And again, we are installing offshore wind turbines and probably some more onshore ones at the rate of knots. And the biggest one uh, is yet to go in in the very near future. That's wind. We're moving on to bio, bio um, energy. Um, this, of course, is what Drax claims, a um, good example of greenwashing, uh, by importing wood pellets from America, many of them, by being heavily subsidised by government, and even then being more expensive than solar and wind, Drax is claiming that it's providing us with lots of clean energy. What you're seeing in the picture is a much better example where waste from flower farms in Kenya are going into three big digesters. Very efficient indeed. And finally, something that's, that's developing very quickly. It, wave action and so on was developing probably 20 years ago, but the government put a stop on it, I think, owing to pressure from the big energy companies. But now the price is falling. Um, there's a lot of work going on in Scotland. And there's a new building going on in Turkey with a Swedish system that will generate a great deal of energy. And the seven barrage is still a possible option. All this is clean energy rather than what we dig up from the ground. And finally, uh, this is Kenya as well. Um, there's not much in the UK. There's a bit developing in Cornwall, but in New Zealand, 20% of their energy comes from under the ground. You dig it deep enough hole, uh, there's a lot of heat down there. Uh, and, fi and almost finally, um, a lot more people now in the last 12 months are thinking seriously, I think, about driving an electric car. I'm not going to say any more about that because I think it will come up in the discussion. I've had run electric cars now for eight years, um, so I've learned a bit in the process. So that's a quick overview. And we just move on, there's about three more slides now so that 
I can give you a little bit of homework. So we're going into group discussions uh, under Barbara's management. Um, you're going to feed back, uh, in essence, what you come up with, and then you'll probably come up with some questions for the general discussion. Next. So this is what you're taking away with you. What three things would you tell someone else to do to save energy at home? And then the second one, if somebody gave you 10,000, how would you spend it to optimize saving energy? And uh, we'll be back again soon. Right, okay, now then, whoever your person who volunteered to do this, I want now to um, put your three top tips into the chat box at the side there. Right, so they should all start to appear. I beat you to it, anyone. Right, come on. The rest of the group leaders, we want your three best top tips in the chat there. So we'll turn down the flow temperature on a condensing gas boiler, concentrate the heat where you are, wear layers, and again, turn the heating down, wear more clothes. Yep, that's that go again. Heating just the person, that's been mentioned several times, heating one or two maximum rooms. Use an engine at cheapest times. Electric blanket, hot water bottle. We thought hot water bottle, but that kind of got phased out. Okay. My little dog is on the bed with me. It's my hot water bottle. I didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't heat rooms, not using energy. Okay. That's all good. Solar panels, wear warm clothing, seal gaps in your house, improve insulation. Movement sensors to switch lights. Ah, Alexis, that's an interesting one. Okay, and from Sue Madison, air source heat pump, good radiator controls, that's, that's good. And solar panels, okay. And okay, 100% wool garments, Jeff, that's good. Professionally avoiding damp issues if necessary. Ah, that's a good point, Colin, okay. And draft excluders. Right. Because now, having looked at all those super ideas from all of you, thank you. Hundred dollar question, hundred thousand, a ten thousand pound question. One person from each group. What was your number one suggestion? So, group. Let's see. Who do we have in these groups? Right. Whoever, Catherine Fish. Catherine Fish. Someone from your group. Yeah. So I, I was feeding back. Um. So we talked quite a bit about efficiency. Um, and so that could go in different directions, but we so we, we emphasised good insulation in the first place. I know you said only one. <laughs> yes, I want one. Ten th I want one suggestion, Catherine. Oh. Have you got ten thousand um, pounds? So um, go for a hydrogen boiler, but that means waiting for a couple of years before they're rolled out. Okay, Colin and Mary, your, what's your ten thousand suggestion? Uh, I think it was. Uh... The consensus was solar panels for those that didn't have them already. Colin, <laughs> they've already spent their, their £10,000, haven't you, Colin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was our group as well. Te solar panels, if you haven't already got them. Yeah. So that was from my group. Um, let's see, Colin. Well, I'm thinking of actually doing this myself because I do have £10,000. Aren't I nice and well off? Yes. Um, but you don't know where I live. So um, <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, Catherine, you do. Um, yeah, both solar panels. I have solar panels already, but they were put in by the builder, and they're woefully inadequate because they're just building standards. So the thing to do is either remove them and replace them, or add add to them to have a much more powerful system that will really capture more energy and battery storage because I'm for two reasons one to level out the consumption and provision so obviously i can use it during the evenings when the sun isn't shining and also because of a stupid rule about the vat that if you have only solar panels or only a battery you pay vat on it but if you have a system with both at the moment it's that vat free brilliant well, thank you colin stupid government as ever mm -hmm. yeah. Alexis, whoever, whatever group Alexis was in. We, we were the same as the last 
speaker. Okay. But uh, spend the money on electric solar panels. We've got we've got the, the the ones for hot water, but electric solar panels and battery. Wonderful. Thank you, Sue Mallinson. Are you in a different group? Uh, we talk particularly about air source heat pumps and thermal heat stores. Um, for the surplus electricity, feeling that batteries were expensive and not so good on storage. So you need to be careful. Um, okay, that, lovely, thank you. And I think the final one, Dave, David Addison put in the three top tips. Are you in a different group, David? Oh, yes, Barbara, thank you. I think our group uh, probably cheated slightly as our answer to the £10,000 question was all of the above. Uh, <laughs> please and thank you. <laughs> Okay, right, David. A cheat accepted, but okay. Uh, did, have I missed any group? If so, speak now. Okay, right. Well, sorry, I was a little bit slow without finding the chat button, but um, we, um, I did put some in, and we, we've already covered all the things that we talked about. But I, we didn't get really round to discussing at great length of uh, the ten thousand pounds. But I think we were partly influenced by the fact that solar panels um, were often available or had already been had their money spent on them so the advice was um air source or ground source heat pump but but make sure you've got your insulation properly in place and good and thick beforehand Thank absolutely you. thank that's really important alan you've got to insulate first all right okay now look that that's great um right right what we'll do now then the the last half hour it's time now to kind of get back to thinking um, about the main main theme that that Mark was talking about, and so it's a time now to to add your bit in if you've got something you'd like to contribute, or something you'd like to ask Mark. And Mark, you come in where, as and when to. And if you want to ask, if you want to say something or ask a question, either wave your hand in the air, or better still, because I've got you on two screens, um, you can use the emoji things. And put a and put up your hand, put up your the the virtual hand like Colin has just done. And John Purdy, nightcap. I liked that. I don't know whether anybody else saw what John put in the chat just now. Nightcap's mm -hmm. definitely a good idea. Okay, Colin, off you go. Unmute yourself and yes, thank you very much. I wanted to ask. I mean, a lot of what we're saying is sort of kind of well known, and it's a matter of individual situations and so on. I wanted to ask about the air source heat pump question because I've seen a post or a, a blog, I think, which I looked at briefly. I'm not sure whether it's a GC person or somebody else I'm connected with some other of the multiple networks that I'm in, um, where they're basically just heating their house using a tradition, what I would call a traditional air conditioner. So that's an air source heat pump or cooler. And what they do is they run it um, in the reverse direction. So in the heating direction. So it still has a coefficient of performance of three or even more, um, the amount of electricity versus the amount of heat that it's producing in the house. But it's literally just blow, it's warming up the air in the house. It's not, not, not trying to put that into uh, a, a water system, into the radiators or anything like that. Um, does anybody on here have any comments on that or any experience? I mean, Mark or anybody else? The only thing I would say on that is that I think I've seen a couple of uh, installations like that, but on the whole, they only benefit one room. The whole concept of um, a, a major air source heat pump is that it distributes the heat evenly and does so best, uh, as I mentioned before, if you can put it under the floor. I've actually only got one radiator in the whole house, and it's the floor. It's not even subdivided. Because we've got a we built a passive slab, it means that <coughs> energy that goes in uh, <coughs> to that um, tube system just below the floor is generating all of its heat or releasing all of its heat into the house. We don't have any heating upstairs at all. Uh, heat rises, and on the average, it's about two, two between two and three degrees cooler, which really it's supposed to be when you sleep upstairs than downstairs there are two towel rails if mm -hmm. i'm honest mm -hmm. right um anybody wait wave in the air if you have something to add to this subject Vaughan, come on in 
Yeah, if you if you look at the um, what's basically you've got an air water heat pump, or you've got an air air heat pump. Yes. Yeah. And if you if you're using a conventional air conditioner, it pumps the air out on the ex extract side, if you like, at whatever temperature you set it at. Yeah. So um, if you have a house where they used to have ducted hot air heating it is possible to distribute it round from a, a, an airflow that's heated through an air air heat exchange. But, but Mark's right, they're, they're best if you use them like you use a through the wall air conditioner into a, a single space. And certainly you know, my son uses that into his office, which is a converted detached garage uh, and it works fine. Mm. But if you want to try and heat a whole house, with a single or, or cool a whole house with a single air conditioner. The, the logic is you wouldn't do it with a single air conditioner. And, and so um, they're cheap. Um, but realistically, you want to get the heat into the wider part of a property and you can't do it with a, a distribution line unless you've got a way of distributing the air. Mm. And we don't usually have that. Okay, mm. thanks. Thanks, Vaughan. Um, any more on that? Uh, oh, Michael, okay. Um, Catherine, you come in with what you want to say then, please. Thank you, Mark. It was very helpful and interesting. Um, um, a lot of us need to plan quite a way ahead to spend £10,000, and it's quite a big outlay at the moment to invest in a heat pump. Do you know anything about the tra tra trajectory of um, price prices of heat pumps initial outlay going down over the next few years I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they will whether they'll go down as much as the reduction that we've seen in solar um <clears throat> I, I doubt because there's a bit more sort of technology there but but uh, manufacturers are, are already I think trying to do that and there are talks that it won't be that long before we could get it depends how big your house is but let's say a six to eight kilowatt um, system in uh, for something nearer to 5,000 than 10,000. But you're always in this quandary. How long do you wait for the technology to cheapen? I mean, as I said earlier, people thought we were totally daft spending 28,000 um, on putting a whole solar roof on the barn. Uh, but whilst there was a uh, it, it was a calculated risk and it turned out OK. But it, you've got to get the balance between. I, I, I'm sure there'll be some new technology. I've never seen technology developing at the rate that it has been of late. It really has been. To, um, the panels that I'm about to put up, um, just six with the storage, generate 410 watts. The panels I've got up on the barn, about the same size, generate 240 watts. So a panel that's more or less the same size is now generating nearly double the amount mm -hmm. of energy. So, you know, it, things are improving and there were talks about a major breakthrough with solar. But you've got you're in this quandary again. How long do I wait? Mm -hmm. And looking at most of us, um, we probably haven't got 20 years to wait. <laughs> I think I think if you follow I, up, I include myself. <laughs> if I follow Mark's comment. And on that point, Catherine, the, um, I've just put a heat pump in. The way I saved money was by putting a two-stage heat pump in. And so I didn't change any of the internal radiator pipe work. So I had no disruption. And you, t you start crossing off. I do not need to redecorate the whole house. I do not need to do this. I do not need to do that. And broadly speaking, it came down to very nearly the price of replacing the boiler. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, there there are ways of doing it apart from looking at the unit heat pump cost. But if you look at the firm that Good Energy has just bought, which is Igloo Works, I think. Um, oh, yes, oh, yeah, sorry, it's Octopus just bought OVO. Yeah, no, it, 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 Good Energy has just bought a heat pump supplier or heat right. pump installer yep. that is that is supposed to be able to deliver a heat pump at a comparable price to an equivalent boiler, gas boiler. Okay. So we're getting down to parity. Yeah. It's a bit like electric cars getting to parity with diesel and petrol. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 
And what I will say is uh, I've done the comparison for a full year now with the gas boiler and the heat pump. And um, my gas has trebled in price. My electricity has only doubled. And on the current prices, on the old prices, I would have saved probably a couple of hundred quid. On the new prices, I'd say 1500 in a year. Mm. It's Mark, and thanks, Vaughan. Mm. Thank you both very much. OK, Sandra, next. It's a slightly different tack. I live in a block of flats. Um, I'm on the ground floor. It's all electric. Um, and our Quaker meeting house is more or less all electric, too. Um, both. Well, certainly the Quaker Meeting House will shortly possibly needing a new roof. And I think, Mark, in some of the information you mentioned, the kind of roofs that incorporate um, solar panels. So I'd just be a bit interested in knowing about if you're replacing a roof, is that a good idea? It, it, it's yeah I mean it's increasingly a good idea we have developed solar panels that in and are in the roof rather than on the roof so that if you're fussy about the look but the big thing now is um is why not make your roof completely of solar panels you've only got to um, have the roof designed so it's waterproof underneath and you wouldn't then put any tiles on you might want to edge it for for cosmetic reasons but I think it's absolutely, if you've got to replace a roof, I think in this day and age, it would be uh, ludicrous not to look at the options. But do be careful because there's still plenty of green washers out there. Um, and I looked pretty carefully before I picked up the um, installer uh, who's going to put my 10 kilowatt pump and another two and a half kilowatts of solar in. Um, if you want any ballpark prices now, um, they still vary a lot. So don't do anything unless you ask three installers or speak to someone who's done it. So you get some real costs. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, if it gives you um, an idea, it just so happens that for a fraction more than 10,000, I will get two and a half kilowatts of 410 watt panels that's just six panels and 10 kilowatts of storage and i've chosen a company that i've been working with um as far as the electric cars concerned called my energy because increasingly some of the uh onboard um developers in this sphere and my energy is one um are developing integrated systems so that I will be able to, as, as I can charge my car while I'm in Kenya, if that's if there's any point from my uh, mobile phone, um, I will also be able to tweak all sorts of things in the house when I'm not there, if the weather changes suddenly. And bear in mind that not long ago, it changed from minus four to plus 11 here in 24 hours. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. And Vaughan, you, you offered to give us some stats. Could you do that, and we'll put them in the we'll put them in a message to everybody on the call. Yeah, I'll try, I've I've got a sort of semi written up thing which I was doing for the people who put the installation in, and it's got the the cost the costings in. They need tidying up, but I've certainly got the the energy costs. So if anybody wants it, then yes, I'll make it available. But um, I'll dig it out and try and make it comprehensible. The other thing coming back on Mark's thing, I, I put in when I was doing all this a thing called an eddy, which is my energy do the device, which simply takes any yeah. when you're when you're exporting solar to the grid, the first thing it does is it diverts it to the immersion heater. Now, what that means is throughout the summer, the heat pump doesn't come on. All my hot water is what would have been exported to the grid. So I get free hot water for six months of the year just by diverting solar that would have gone to the grid. And for, for me, that's a jolly sight more 
sensible than a battery. Yeah, but I'm not sense. comfortable putting a battery in an integral garage. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fire risk. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm an engineer. I, I get confused. <laughs> oh, if you excuse my typing, which is appalling, and the spelling, which is worse, because I'm trying to do, um, I just put a. Oh, I can't even see there. <laughs> it's awful. Um, I just came across today because the Methodist Church in Kenilworth is running a workshop um, on, is that happens to be on electric cars, this one, um, run um, remotely by a guy up in Scotland who turn, turns out to be a real expert on, uh, he's an electrochemist. And I just read earlier, uh, because I can't get to the, uh, to, to the meeting, um, his view on whether you ever charge a, Colin will be interested, ever charge a car up to um, 100 percent all the time, what it does to the battery. But he's done some brilliant YouTubes about 10 minutes long on why we are paying what we're paying for energy at the moment and what needs to be done. I think there's at least 10 uh -huh. YouTubes on there. And all you really need from what I put, it doesn't seem to be there now. Um, yeah, it's there, Mark. It is there, is it? It's yeah, it's, it's called plug life tv that's all yep, you need there. to look up on youtube is there plug in the chat? Life TV. thanks mark it's there in the chat people can see it there okay we've got three people with hands up we're going to try and get from each of you the last 15 minutes so john anderson floor is yours we've had pv photovoltaic tiles on our house for 14 years and uh, they are fine we've never done anything to them whatsoever the snow in the winter we're in yorkshire cleans them uh, York Minster is at the moment finishing a refectory outside York Minster, which I'm involved with in a small way, and they have got end-to-end -end photovoltaic tiles on that. Uh, I have I've seen them. I've had nothing to do with putting them on. Uh, secondly, solar hot water panels we've had for 14 years, and I wouldn't recommend them now. They're 20th century technology. They have pumps. Uh, they have uh, water in them, obviously. And over the 15 years, we've had to spend about £400 having the water changed, the coolant changed, and various things done to them. Much better, what was mentioned just now, an IMASUM or similar apparatus mm -hmm. for putting, for diverting the electricity from the PV into the, into the tank. Um, batteries, I thought we were going to hear more about batteries. I don't know much about them, and I would like to hear more if anybody's got anything more to say because we're about to put them in in Bailed and Methodist Church, where I go. Um, and obviously, we put, we put lots of solar panels on, and I take the point about mixing that with batteries. But I think we've now reached the point where the battery life, the ones I most recently looked at, is 25 years, not 10. That changes mm. the um, equation completely. And uh, for church which obviously is open in the evening in the winter it's a very useful thing to have batteries when our massive pv panels are generating nothing uh, we didn't mention a far infrared heating and i'm not sure we have this in bailed methodist church a lot of it whether it is in fact better in the long term the price of electricity should plunge in the next 20 years as we go on to renewable because plainly the price of producing it the cost of producing it wind and solar is so low and as soon as we can decouple it from a gas which is what yeah. we should have done 10 years ago it will fall in other words to have far infrared heaters which have no maintenance which will not be replacing after say 12 years like like, uh, like an air source heat pump may be the best thing to do because once you've got them in all you do is get the electricity into them and they heat you the body and yeah. the liquid not the air far infrared heaters are worth looking at uh, we live in a bungalow which is the worst possible thing you can live in for what we're talking about here for air source heat pumps and so on and i uh, the only answer with us really is is massive insulation and uh, uh looking probably i think at far infrared panels and lastly we didn't mention we did mention the seven barrage i think that's dead and i hope it is because of the ecological effects what we should be looking at is uh, tidal lagoons as of Swansea, Swansea, where the water comes in and out, turning the turbines and generates electricity. And to do that, we have to get the accountants away from controlling it and saying, ah, it takes 100 years to get your money back. 
and say, what does it take in terms of carbon emissions? What does it cost us in health? All the other bits that the accountants always miss out. It may take 100 years to get your money back on putting in tidal barrages, but in that time, the carbon dioxide emissions are lowered and the health of the people is improved. Yeah, we might not be here in 100 years if things don't change around a bit. No, well, we won't be. Oh, I see humanity. Yeah. Right. No, no. <laughs> John, that was amazing. Thank you for all those. Now, John asked if anyone knew, had anything to contribute on batteries. Has yes, anyone please. put one in or got something to say? Wave. Where I've got caught Jeff and Davey waiting to come in with a question, but wave your hands if you've got experience of batteries and can come and contribute on that. I don't see. Oh, Colin. Mark, Colin. Colin. Colin has, yeah. Colin, come on in. Yes, uh, we have a couple of batteries. I had one installed originally with our PV system, and then I got a second one because we switched over to cooking with electricity, and I wanted to make sure I could um, cover that as well. Um, they're currently in the loft, which I discovered is not such a good idea because it gets very cold up there. <laughs> so I'm in the process of moving them uh, into our utility room. And uh, I haven't really done it on financial grounds. Um, it was more, you know, for reducing carbon emissions. Um, so whether they actually pay for themselves, I don't know. But at the moment they are because I'm topping them up um, at a very low off-peak rate and using that to run the house the rest of the day. So um, I'm not using any daytime energy at all, really, at the moment. Um, and we get a bit of top-up, obviously, from the solar when we get sun this time of year. So... Um, for me, they, they've been great. They're LIFEPO batteries, so they are less risky um, from a fire perspective. Mark, do you yeah, want I to just wanted to say that uh, up to two years ago, you probably wouldn't have known about a battery unless it was a Tesla. Um, Tesla had the most efficient um, battery in terms of cost per kilowatt, if you could afford the um, cost price. But when I explored six months ago, first of all, there was a waiting list for six to nine months. And then when I went to a, a major exhibition at NEC, I realized how many more manufacturers were suddenly coming on board, still giving you a 10 year um, guarantee, but also giving you a substantially better deal. Um, Give Energy have got uh, their own, uh, just, just go on the web and have a look but you'd get a lot more um, value in terms of cost per kilowatt, I think, um, from some of the new batteries like Give Energy uh, and My Energy uh, and others which are coming through. And I think the price uh, for those will go down. How much, I'm not sure, because um, we're still, nobody's mentioned it yet, but we're still very much in the lithium era. And there's an ethical issue there for those of us who drive electric cars and, and in a host of other batteries, I think, as to how the raw materials for the battery are currently sourced. But I did a bit more research before this uh, meeting this afternoon, and I was ple pleasantly surprised to see how much deep um, uh, research work is going on on alternative batteries, not even some of them without even lithium. I think there's a lithium salt battery. There were at least eight different batteries currently, um, new technologies being tested at the moment. So I think it's a bit like solar panels were at the beginning, give it a couple of years, uh, maybe five at the most. And I think we'll find there are alternative sources that don't need um, youngsters digging things up in parts of Central Africa, which is still a little bit of a, a nagging worry. Thank you, Mark, that, that certainly is. Now I'm going to give Jeff and David Shaw a chance to get in. Sandra and Katja, we won't get to you. I'm so sorry. Jeff. Yes, only. But when, uh, are you hearing me? Yes. Uh, only very briefly. Uh, first of all, uh, electric vehicles uh, not taxed. Uh, beware that will change yes. soon, if not very soon. Uh, although the cost may not be great compared to all the other fuel costs you're uh, 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 suffering at the, at the moment. Uh, smart meters, uh, the one I had is just useless, just doesn't work properly at all, possibly because the gas meter is too far away from it. 
and I've never understood why they are praised the way they are. Is it Generation One or Two? Oh, I've no idea. No idea. All they, were, I know. they were very bad at the beginning. I was pestered by Bob, email after email. I got so fed up with it. I said, okay, I'll have one. They came and did it, and it's never worked. Anyway, mm. that, never mind that. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd be interested to know uh, maybe um, why oh. the oh. an air source, an air, air source heat pump is no good for a bungalow. Yeah. And lastly, do cold shower every day of the year. It's very invigorating. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. And David Shaw, come in with your question. We'll see if we can get answers to, to the Jeffs and to yours. What did you want to yeah, say? Yeah, it, it, it was just a reflection, really, because one of the things I did to, to reduce my energy consumption was to move into a small house. So my downstairs is open plan, just one room with kitchen and living room. Upstairs, I've got two small bedrooms and a bathroom. But when I looked to replace my gas boiler with an air source heat pump, and I also looked at geo, uh, sorry, solar thermal. I was going to be spending more money using electricity to top up the temperature in the water tank to make sure there was no risk of Legion, Legionnaire's disease. Um, so actually installing that system, replacing the gas was going to cost me far more money. And um, so I've opted, because I've already got PV panels on my roof, um, I've also opted for a solar diverter to charge up um, some battery packs that I use to uh, plug in um, like electric fleeces uh, and things like that in the winter. Uh, but also I can, I can use it to, to charge up other devices as well. So, um, but I didn't know whether there was any solutions for smaller properties where the costs of running air source or ground source heat pumps or, or solar thermal uh, pumps uh, was going to outweigh the benefits. Thank you, David. Mark, do you want to just finish with a minute or so responding to that? Yeah, there's a, there, there's a, a lot in that. The, the, the nature and the size of the property uh, is always um, something to be reckoned with. Um, and, and I think I would underline what was said earlier is, is always go for keeping the heat in first before you start looking at what you're going to spend your 10,000 or whatever else it is, because otherwise uh, you're literally going to be um, heating the, the garden in some way or other. So that really is important. You do need to watch, as someone else said, you do need to watch the problems of damp. I did, um, I did a cavity wall fill. Who? Uh, best part of best part of 40 years ago, I think, when it was brand new. But I did my homework very well. I knew that there was a, re there was a reasonably well-built house. There was a two-inch cavity. But I chose not the foam. I chose, or, or not, not the liquid foam that um, uh, sets. I chose to use tiny micro granules that were blown in. There were holes drilled at various places, and that really did make a difference. And we never had any damp problems at all. So you know there are ways of doing it. Um, on on the technology, I think we we've summarised it now. Um, we know that solar has come down to about a quarter of its price. Um, if anybody after the discussion or later on by email wants uh, to compare any notes, if they're in my part of the country, we've already got my current installer, I think, probably going to do the Manses, um, which South Warwickshire is now deciding we, we are going for gold as far as eco circuit is concerned. So we're looking at all kinds of aspects uh, of eco, particularly energy. Great. Thank you, Mark. And just a couple of things in the chat. Do any of you Folks know if there's online information available about environmental footprint of batteries. If so, if you could pop it in the chat, that would be great. Or maybe we can pick it up on ceiling. Is, um, there, some, is there not something in eco in ethical consumer? Ah, if so, can someone find that reference and we can circulate it round to people? I thought I'd seen something, but it may have been somewhere else, Barbara. If I find something, I'll let you know. Please do. And then a lovely suggestion from Capture, one way to save money and save energy per person is to live in a, in a house with a lot, lot more people than just one. So you've got five in a house, you know, you're effectively going to be saving energy. Thank you, Katja. Now, 
Well, thank you all very much for being here on our first of the 2023 series of Green Christian Workshops. I'm delighted to say that we've got, well, there's a threesome of us who are organizing these this year. Catherine Fish, who you heard, and wave Catherine so people can see you, and David Pattinson, who is on my second screen, but is here somewhere. So Catherine, David, and I will be um, sorting out some more topics for us to be looking at. But the next one is a little bit different. Um, we were approached by Faith for Change in Liverpool, wanting to run somebody to give a talk on LOAF, our Green Christian Principles, so they didn't know they were ours, local, animal, uh, organically grown, animal friendly and fairly traded for an event in Liverpool by Zoom. And so I'm going to be giving that talk and there's somebody speaking on Echo Church and it's a build as a workshop for now. So we're going to have that as our next in our series of Green Christian Workshops on March the 1st, but note the time difference. It will be 6.15 to 7.15. So we'll send you all details of that in the E News as usual. And um, we look forward to seeing you on that. And hopefully first Wednesday in every month or Easter puts a little bit of a wrinkle in it. Once a month, we'll hope to see you again. Thank you again to Mark. Barbara, can I just uh, indicate, I don't know who can see it or not now, but I put an email and a, a phone number and corrected the contacts on uh, YouTube in the chat if people can see it. Okay. Well, we won't switch off for a while, so you can stay and look at the chat if you want to, but it's quarter past eight, so I'm going to say goodbye to all of you. Thank you for being here and hope to see you on some of the workshops we're running in the future. Thank you very much. Bye.